Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm very excited to be here with you today. I'm Guadalupe Moreno, and um, I will be presenting today uh, a sh very short uh, approach to the artistic development in Mexico. Before I start, I would like to say thank you to Viana Kobe, now was uh, executive director, and also Sarah Innsberg, the digital contact coordinator, who both of them have been has been very, have been very kind to help me um, preparing the this uh, presentation for today with all the technical issues. And as I said, I'm very very excited to be here with you today. I have a lot of uh, paintings through my slides in my presentation, so I will be giving you some uh, information about them. Uh, this uh, main uh, painting is about Diego Rivera, Mexican muralist, who painted uh, this mural at the National Palace in Mexico City. It is called Mexico Through the Centuries, and it was painted in 1929 through 1935. Sorry. So today um, we have only 30 minutes. So I would like to give you like some shots of information. Um, so I hope you can get a, a better um, sense of how Mexican art um, developed, um, especially in the last um, century, 20th century and and the actual uh, years on the, of the 21st century. So I'm gonna make a very, very short introduction on how uh, Mexican culture um, is, uh, or how we understand today. So we will go to uh, move to how this um, national identity was constructed through the visual arts, mainly in the 20th century, to move a little bit uh, more in the cultural policy framework and see how from the government side, all the uh, visual arts and specifically, but mainly arts and culture have been promoted and fostered since uh, the government structure. And finally, to end uh, with this presentation, I will give you like some shots of uh, women in the visual arts uh, in Mexico, uh, just some of them because they are a lot, but some uh, of them who I consider very um, influential and uh, interesting. So Mexico as a country, as we know today, is the result of the encounter or even a clash of two different uh, cultures. As we can see in this uh, mural by Jorge Camarena, is the fusion of two cultures, that's the name, and it was painted in 1926. And as you can see in the, in the painting, it represents the birth of the Mexican culture as a product, as, as I said, of a clash of two different cultures, the Nahuatl, which uh, was flourished in Mesoamerica, and also the Spanish culture. This is clearly symbolized here in, in this uh, painting in the figure of the Eagle Warrior and the Spanish Cuencor, both of whom died at the same time in the fight. The Mexican homeland will be built by the result of, of these two worldviews. This is another way to, to, to see this same encounter. I have to say that it has been represented through the arts in many different ways, in many different moments. This is by a Mexican uh, women uh, muralist. Few of, the, uh, few of the women muralists that we have in Mexico, we have a lot of painting, but a few of um, um, women muralists. And this is called uh, The First Encounter by Aurora Reyes, painted in 1936. So how was this uh, identity or national identity constructed through the visual arts um, in the 20th century? We have to go back to the Mexican Revolution in 1910 that spanned a cultural renaissance and inspired artists to look inward in search of a specifically Mexican artistic language. The visual vocabulary was designed to transcend the realm of the arts and given a national identity to this population undergoing transition. So the artwork produced during the turbulent time in Mexico history was crafted and produced a unified aesthetic. So we have to say in a country with uh, almost 90% of 
illiteracy uh, rate, uh, at that moment, there was a call for artists to depict the desires of the revolution. And there is where the Mexican muralist Diego Rivera arise as a key um, artist and as a key um, um, a person, artist through this um, um, uh, century. Diego Rivera was elected to adorn the walls of the Escuela Nacional Preparatoria in Mexico City. And please let me go back to, to that slide, which this mural that you can see here, it is in this school. Now is the former school of San Ildefonso that served as a exhibition space. Uh, this is, uh, maybe you cannot perceive, but this is the stage. Uh, it's a beautiful mural. It was called The Creation, and it was um, painted by Diego Rivera in 1922 and 1923. It is an amphitheater, which I think it's around 500, 700 seats, and it's a beautiful uh, romantic style uh, theater, the, an explained acoustic. So Diego Rivera, along with uh, Orozco, Jose Clemente Orozco and David Alfaro Siqueiros became the, the well-known big three uh, muralist and artist. So as I said, um, um, at that time, the, the illiteracy was um, uh, a, a big problem at the time in Mexico that um, the government had to make an open call to artists to produce murals where people can learn about the history, learn about a key elements, key concept at that time. So Diego Rivera uh, was elected, as I said, to decorate this um, Escuela Nacional Preparatoria, where also this mural that you can see here by Jose Clemente Orozco was painted. Uh, this mural was called um, um, Cortés y la Malinche, Cortés the Spanish conquer and La Malinche was an indigenous woman who quickly um, learned the Spanish and served as a personal translator to uh, Cortes. Both of them also have a, a, a relationship. And um, so the, the art under the president Porfirio Diaz was uh, tinged with the European aesthetic and sentiment. Porfirio Diaz, the president, had this very strong feeling of, of, of feeling as, as a European, and all the art had a, a very strong um, aesthetic influence by the Europeans at that time. Also, um, it was the, the muralist was um, uh, it was influenced by the Spanish conquest of the Aztec lands and Rivera, Diego Rivera's mural were notable uh, divergence from the art of this uh, time. He also was, uh, as a communist, uh, was really much uh, influenced by the Soviets at that time. Diego Rivera, together with Jose Clemente Orozco and Siqueiros, as I said, became very well known and they were called Los Tres Grandes or the Big Three. So despite the difference in uh, the political belief among the three of them, the three artists play a very important uh, instrumental role in building a national identity. Their murals found inspiration in the visual remaining of the Catholic conqueror and also the wall painting of the Aztec culture. The actualization of these scenes through the arts serve as a social purpose to establish a public and unrestricted dialogue. The big three had grown up during the time of the president Porfirio Diaz within a highly societally and economically stratified society. And the proliferation of information fought against these inequalities. Without intending to do so, uh, the Mexican Revolution created a lasting impact on an international scale. This mural by David Alfaro Siqueiros was called the New Democracy and was painted in 1944 to 1945. And it is, it's actually a show at the uh, Fine Arts Palace in Mexico City. And Siqueiros moved later to New York and uh, led the experimental workshop, having uh, Jackson Pollock as one of his uh, very uh, young students at that time. Let's move now um, to the uh, cultural scope, cultural policy framework scope. So after the revolution time, um, 
it was created the Secretary of Public Education in 1921. That was a key um, moment at Mexico because at that time after the revolution, the mainly budget of the government divided in two different ways. One to the, of course, uh, military uh, um, budget, but the second most important uh, factor in the budget was education. So it was a huge, um, um, massive strategy going, uh, undergoing through the educational purpose, uh, through um, the Secretary of Public Education, whose main figure was Jose Vasconcelos. He made, he made, he made a, a, a very important uh, public um, publications um, going all over the country, as well as um, financing artists and muralists to do all this work that we already seen. After that, uh, we uh, move a little bit uh, to the to the um, more recent time at the end of the 20th century, and the National Council for the Arts, which was called CONACULTA in Mexico, that's the acronym, was created in, in 1988, and it was um, um, created to uh, foster the the. Um, the and coordinate all the cultural and artistic policies in the country they when it was created was tried to be like this umbrella organization that uh, gather all the uh, agencies and institutions in the government that has any deal with arts and culture so it mainly dedicated to promote support and foster culture and the arts the immediate president of this Conaculta was the Department of Culture, which was part of the Secretary of Public Education. And then um, among all um, the reasons that uh, lead all these institutions and foundation was the role of stimulating and encouraging both artistic and cultural creation, ensuring full freedom of creators. And in the same way, it was considered that Conaculta, this National Arts Council, must encourage artistic expression of social groups from different regions across the country in order to promote, preserve, and enrich historic and artistic and cultural heritage of the nation. So one of the key um, uh, factors that I have to say is still need to develop um, much much uh, further in Mexico is is the centralization. It's it's a big country, not as big as the U.S., but uh, still is a big country and very centralized country. So one of the main purpose of this administration and and the previous one was try to decentralize. And in this sense, um, uh, the, the, it was created. We have in Mexico City the National Art Center, uh, which gathered the, the, the schools of arts, um, I have to say, visual arts, uh, uh, theater or drama, uh, dance, uh, classical and contemporary dance, cinema, and music. All these uh, schools were gathered in, in, in the same complex, trying to, uh, to achieve an interdisciplinary work. And they um, have performing spaces where they can link the artistic life with the educational life. Probably more like uh, I have to, Lincoln Center in New York, this kind of complex, I, I have to say, National Art Center in Mexico, I think it's a bit bigger. So it was created in 1992. And after that, um, uh, start to really work for the centralization and focus on um, different states in Mexico. And, and after going a diagnosis and find the, the, the most um, um, discipline uh, they work uh, in this discipline in this state. So for example, Oaxaca is a state where a lot of visual artists emerge. In this state, they created a, a beautiful art center that worked for education, but also for promotion and production of this specific artistic discipline. Some of them works with many different disciplines. That is the case of the one that you have here in the screen, which is San Luis Potosí. I have to say this is a beautiful art center. Let me go um, to this picture that used to be a jail in the 20th century. So it's very recent and it's a, it's a major um, achievement of this um, 
of the recent years in the cultural policy sector to uh, um, transform a jail, a repression uh, space to uh, an art space of freedom of expression. Um, I, I was part of the of the renovation of this space and and the and the starting program, and I have to say in the inauguration it was really emotional to see um, people who were uh, one person who was in prison a, a few years ago at that place and he came for the inauguration and he was crying to say uh, how happy he was to see the transformation of, of the space for the freedom of expression and all these beautiful things. And then all the people around start crying as well. So uh, just to have an idea, this the main entrance where the courts were now work or self serve as uh, exhibition spaces. And here where you can see the, the, the the main buildings of the of the jail that was built in a panoptical um, format, and one of each of these buildings were is devoted to a different discipline. So one is an arts library, the other one work for visual arts workshops, the other one for drama, music, and uh, and so on. So. This is uh, a, a very interesting network that has been grown for the last 20 years. Uh, there is not represented in all the states, in Mexican states. Actually, there should be around 20 art center and some of state has more than one. So it's not very even distribution, but it's a, it's a very important one. The other uh, main important um, arts institution uh, in, in Mexico is the National Autonomous University. It is one of the most important universities, public universities in, in Latin America. And uh, it was the bill, the, the construction of the National Autonomous University started in 1910 um, during the revolution. Now it's a huge complex. Um, uh, the campus is uh, named by UNESCO as national, uh, sorry, as, as cultural heritage, uh, humanity cultural heritage. It's a beautiful building. This is actually, the, the building has a mural by Diego Rivera and some of other buildings is, is the same. This uh, university has a cultural complex, is is a huge uh, cultural complex with, with a, 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 a really big concert hall, exhibition spaces, um, a, a sculpt, a sculpture gardens, um, theaters, it's, it's huge. All the arts, uh, I have to say the university is free for the student. They just pay a very symbolic fee. I think it's like a, a dollar for a year. So it's a very symbolic um, fee. And all the um, cultural program, it's also free for the student and it is open to, to everyone who want to enjoy. So this is also a major institution in terms of uh, promoting um, the arts. Sorry, I also forget to mention, and I think it's very uh, relevant in, in, in this presentation, they have the Contemporary Art Museum, which is very uh, important museum in the Mexican scenes. So another very important institution is FONCA. It can be similar to the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, I also have to say that FONCA was um, a bit inspired in, in, in the NEA. It was created by, uh, I have to say, by the pressure of many artists at that time in 1989 um, that wanted to have a a system that promote and, and give support, financial support to artists to um, ensure the, uh, the production of the art production in the country. So the FONCA, this institution, invests in professional cultural projects that arise in the artistic community, offer funds so that creators can develop their work without any restriction, affirming the exercise of freedom of expression and creation. I have to say that all the there are open calls for artists who can uh, many different kind of um, calls and focus in different disciplines and the, the who decide how the money is distributed is not the government. It is a, a board of artists, a, a jury formed by artists, um, recognized artists who decide 
who have the, the quality uh, to receive these, these funds. So uh, for this reason, it invites artists and creators to participate in its program by submitting proposals that are evaluated and judging by, by a selection commission made up, made up of artists and creators. There, there is also a very interesting uh, system inside this uh, fund, which is the National System of Arts Creators. And it, it, this system um, uh, try to um, uh, promote artistic creativity through granting or of distinction and economic incentive. So that for a specific time, artists and intellectuals dedicate themselves exclusively to create works, as well as to stimulate creators' talent and excellence with action that allow uh, the promotion of individual creation and thereby contribute to the increase of cultural heritage of Mexico. The system is divided in three categories. There is one for younger creators who is who are starting their career. Then there is another national uh, system of creator, which is the main um, the main system, mainly artists from their 30s to their 50s, even 60s. And then we have the emeritus uh, system creator who are um, artists more in their adult life who have uh, really a consolidated um, career. All of them perceive an amount of money in different categories and uh, in exchange of that uh, funding that they receive, they have to make a social contribution. That is um, to say, for example, uh, a an art center in uh, California, Baja California, uh, in the north of Mexico, want to create um, a workshop with um, a visual artist. Uh, let's say, for example, um, Plinio Avila, a young artist. So they make a request to the to the FONCA, the system, to um, invite him to the to to give a workshop to this uh, group of local artists. The government pay him the plane ticket. The, he doesn't charge any, um, any fee because it's part of his contribution because of perceiving this uh, kind of grant of the national creator system. And the local uh, institution who invite him, um, here the case of the, the art center, just pay the hotel or meals or this kind of thing. So it, it really uh, become a very interesting model, model to again, to the centralize and to, um, to get the most out of this uh, grant system and also for the artists to have this contribution to the, to the Mexicans, to the, to the society because of the grant that they perceive. They have to do that, I think it's twice a year. So it's not that a, a big deal uh, for them and it's really manageable. So now let's move to the third part of the presentation and let's talk about some of the notorious Mexican women artists. I have to say that they are um, not all of them. There are many and it will take hours to, to talk about them, but yes, a, a quick um, uh, overview. Uh, this painting that you can see here is uh, the the fruit merchant by Olga Costa Olga Costa sorry and it was painted in 1951. Well, yesterday I was talking with uh, Sarah preparing that meeting and she told me um, she saw a Frida Kahlo movie uh, uh, last weekend and then um, I wasn't sure about in, uh, getting Frida Kahlo in the presentation because obviously she is a notorious uh, Mexican artist but I am pretty sure that all of you know, know her so uh, but because of that meeting uh, I thought it was uh, important to, to introduce her uh, in the presentation. Uh, I have to say, I'm not very, um, I'm very, I'm more interested in Frida's life uh, rather than in her work. Um, I think her life is very interesting, uh, but his artistic work, uh, I'm not, I mean, the quality of her artistic work, I think is not, um, it's not a, one of my favorites. Uh, although Kahlo dreamlike approach to art 
uh, took the inward uh, focus on her contemporaries to a more personal level, her flamboyant attire and intimate expression serve as a political purpose rather than a surrealist uh, one. Through her costume, she rejected the European clothing that became predominant in Mexico. As I said before, we had, um, uh, because of the uh, Porfirio Diaz president that was very much uh, influenced and, and really, he was really a, a fan of, of um, a European aesthetic, rejected this European aesthetic and she always wore Mexican costumes and, and hairstyle and, and flowers, which is really representative uh, of her figure. And her prediction of her own physical trauma served as a reflection of the suffering she saw in her country. Uh, you probably know that she suffered uh, an accident. Um, she was in a, in a bus, in a public bus, and she suffered an accident that damaged her back. So she has a lot of um, abortions because not a lot, I think it was two uh, abortion after that accident. And it was a um, really traumatic experience for Frida. Another very interesting artist that I like very much, I have to say that you will see some of the artists that we're going through today. They are not um, Mexican, they are, um, they are, influ they become from other countries. Mexico serve as a very, it's a very welcome and open country and, and, and serve uh, as asylum for many nationalities uh, coming from, for example, the Spanish Civil War or even the, the Second World War. So some of them are not uh, born in, in Mexico, but they become Mexico after the years. That is the case of Remedios Varo, who was born in, um, in Spain, in, in Gerona. And she moved to uh, Mexico uh, after uh, a Nazi persecution. She was living at, in Paris in 1941 when Nazis uh, get into Paris, and then she moved to Mexico. And after that, she never came back to, to Spain. Uh, she was a surrealistic artist that evokes a world that emerged from the imagination were uh, mystical, scientific, exoteric, combined in one. This is a very uh, beautiful artwork that I like very much of Remedios Barrio, and it's called Harmony. Another very interesting Mexican art, well, Mexican uh, British born uh, artist, Leonora Carrington, that moved very young to Mexico. Uh, she's also a surrealistic painter, and she was also a novelist. She lived most of her adult life in Mexico City and was one of the last surviving participants in the surrealistic moment in the 1930s. Leonora Carrington was also a founding member of the women's liberation movement in Mexico during the 70s. Uh, she was very close to Edward James and they built a beautiful um, surrealistic garden in the middle of the jungle in San Luis Potosí. I really encourage you to visit if you once uh, come to, to Mexico or San Luis Potosí. Helen Escobedo, it's also uh, some of the artists that I am uh, that I will mention here are part of this national system uh, creators and um, emeritus creator that I mentioned from the National Arts Fund. Uh, Helen Escobedo. Uh, was a, a, a multifaceted artist. Um, she works mainly in sculpture, uh, but she was also a painter, printmaker, installation artist, writer, and even a performer. Uh, she was um, the director of the Modern Art uh, Museum and also the head of the department of the museum and galleries at the National Autonomous University that we already mentioned. Uh, she continued uh, her craft um, work while she was in these uh, positions and she was very prolific. This work is called uh, Coato and it was uh, built in the Sculptoric Garden at the National Autonomous University in 1980. This is uh, one artist that I really uh, like very much is Graciela Iturbide. Is, uh, she is a photographer. She was born in Mexico City in 1942. Uh, this work is called um, Our Lady of Iguanas. 
He was a photographer in 1979. Uh, she worked, um, her, or her work has been exhibited internationally. She worked very close with Francisco Toledo, a very a famous artist and art advocacy, and included many major museums uh, collections, such as uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and also her work is at the Getty Museum. Uh, she became interested in the daily life of Mexico, indigenous culture and people, especially the, the cultures of uh, Oaxaca state, which is Zapotec, uh, Mixteco and Seri. And she photographed uh, their lifestyle. Um, uh, she also focused on identity, on sexuality, festival, rituals, daily life, death, and also roles of women. Graciela also shared visual stories of cultural in different uh, transitional uh, periods. Let's go now to another uh, sculptor, Angela uh, Gurria, who was born in Mexico in 1929. Um, uh, she was a sculptor and became the first female member of the um, Arts Academy in Mexico. This work is called Amistad and it was built in 1968 uh, because of the Olympic summer uh, games uh, that took place in Mexico. And finally, one uh, uh, younger artist that I like it very much is Betsa de Romero. She was born in 1963 in Mexico City, and she worked with also a sculpture, installation, printmaker, um, photograph, videos, um, many uh, elements that she took from, from the landscape, uh, like used tired or um, chewing gums, all of that weird things. Uh, she has exceedingly worldwide and she combined all these traditional Mexican symbols, images and, and themes to reflect uh, on history, culture and the contradiction of modernity. Um, this was a very, I cannot uh, transmit here or through this picture, the sense of being in this exhibition that was also in the former school of San Ildefonso, the, the building that I mentioned before where all Diego Rivera and Orozco and Siqueiros murals are. And this was an altar de muertos, is the celebration of the death in Mexico. And it is called with pain and fragility. Uh, she make uh, a, a, a work to um, uh, offer this uh, altar to women uh, that died because of, um, of um, uh, um, how do you say that, sorry. <laughs> um, killed by their couple, their uh, male couple. Uh, it's really um, emotional artwork and very uh, beautiful. So just to finish uh, with the presentation, I, will, I want to go quickly through some questions that uh, Sarah sent me uh, this morning through the, uh, the email. Um, one of them was, um, who is your favorite uh, Mexican artist? Uh, I have to say that I have a lot of artists. I love artists who combine um, art activism and political activism through the arts. So in this sense, Francisco Toledo, who passed away last year, is one of my favorites. She's also from Oaxaca. Um, Graciela Iturbide, the, the photographer, is also one of my favorite artists. And I, as I say, Betsabe Romero, many of these artists that I uh, talk about today, um, I really uh, enjoy their art. The second question was, uh, does Mexico have any big art events like the Venice Biennale? Well, I have to say we have um, Marco Song, which is an uh, uh, arts fair. It is started in 2002 in Monterrey by a woman. Um, very talented women that start this art fair in Monterrey and then she decided to move it to Mexico City to make it more bigger and impact. Through the last 18 years, uh, this uh, MACO fair became a, a very important event in not only in Latin America, I have to say in, in the visual arts uh, landscape. It has two main events through the year, 
February, which is more devoted to the contemporary art, and September. They divided uh, the, the, the fair in three main uh, categories, one devoted to uh, contemporary art, Yard, another one to photography, and a third one to uh, antiques. The following question was um, how people in America can get involved in the arts? Well, um, I have to say if you uh, would like to to involve more in, in a practice way to, to do the um, to practice art. I have to say one of these art center, which is more prolific, especially in the visual arts is Oaxaca. Uh, many um, artists and really famous worldwide artists go to teach in Oaxaca or to work with a teacher and, and artists in Oaxaca because they are so close with Francisco Toledo and he really um, uh, consider and, and, and value the work that Toledo have done for Oaxaca. So they find it like a place where they can uh, enjoy relaxing and produce artwork. So I will suggest Oaxaca will be one of the, the main states to work in the visual arts in Mexico. And the last question was uh, books about Mexican artists. Uh, there is one that I, I think it is in English, which is a women artist of modern Mexico. And it's mainly about Frida Kahlo contemporary artist. But there is also a, um, one um, catalog uh, which was made by one um, art museum in, in, in Chihuahua in the north of Mexico. And it is uh, free, it is online in issue.com. And it is in Spanish, but I think it's a good uh, catalog. And it is about Mexican painters. It's called Pintoras Mexicanas. So um, I think I get a little bit over time. Sorry for that. Uh, I hope you enjoy this little short um, presentation. Uh, I know it's very fast and, and it goes through many different things, but I wanted to give you an overview of the, of the development of the art and the visual arts in, in Mexico. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Biana, and thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye.